Welcome to this OST2 course about the TPM's built-in protection against machine-in-the-middle attacks. There is more than one way the TPM can protect our communication from such attacks. However, one of these approaches provides the highest guarantees. This feature is called parameter encryption. Before we can answer what parameter encryption is, we need to understand what TPM sessions are. There are three types of TPM sessions. One of them is inherent because the authorization slots in any TPM command is a maximum of three. We can supply authorization for the parent, we can supply authorization for the child, and maybe we supply a policy. When we supply a password, we don't need to actually start a TPM session. We just provide the password in plain form. As you can imagine, this is not secure. Therefore, we can use HMAC session to protect the communication. HMAC session takes authorization value from an object to feed its key derivation function to create a session key. Then we have a key exchange between the host and the TPM. This is a one-time transaction. Once this happens, the HMAC session refreshes with nonce from the caller and from the receiver, meaning from the host and from the TPM. This is to prevent replay attacks. On top of an HMAC session, we can have a policy, and this is then called a policy session. The policy session feeds itself with more than out value for entropy. It can take the state of the TPM, it can take various other parameters, and we'll talk more about this in our advanced course. The policy session can be used for authorization, but before we can perform any authorization, we would need to craft a policy digest. And for that purpose, we have a trial session, which is used to generate the policy digest. In a way, we can say a trial is a policy session only for computation. To put things into perspective, when we issue a TPM command, there are three authorization slots that we can use. Most commands use only one authorization slot. Some use two, and rarely we need all three. To protect the communication of the TPM, we can put a HMAC session in one of these authorization slots. To start HMAC session, we would need to learn about the TPM to start out session command, and we will do that in a moment. Because a policy session is built on top of an HMAC session, we can also use a policy session to protect against machine in the middle attacks. The highest guarantee we can receive is when we enable parameter encryption. So what is parameter encryption? There's two flags that we can set to a session that instruct the TPM to expect encrypted parameters to incoming commands or instruct the TPM to send results from the commands, the responses with encrypted parameters. There is a limitation. We can only encrypt the very first parameter of any comment that supports parameter encryption. Why not all comments support parameter encryption? Because not every comment has sensitive information. Let's think about TPM NV increment that increases the counter in the TPM's NVRAM by one. Other than the authorization values to authorize this action, there is nothing sensitive in this comment. So we can protect this comment by simply creating an HMAC session. And we'll see how to do that later on. In other cases, when we create a key, we need to provide not just the authorization for the parent, but also we need to provide new authorization for the child key. This resides at the beginning of the comment, in the first parameter, in a field, in a place called insensitive. To protect that field from machine in the middle attacks, we can encrypt. To achieve this, we need to supply the TPM comment with a TPM session. This TPM session needs to have the two flags for encrypting the parameter request and the comment response set. We're going to take a closer look at the TPM comments to see what and how parameter encryption can protect. But before that, I want to address the topic of TPM sniffing. Contrary to popular beliefs, TPM sniffing is not possible because of failure in the protection of the TPM or in its mechanisms and algorithms. Often, if not always, is the result of misconfiguration. OEMs and OS vendors fail to enable parameter encryption, fail to enable early or forget to enable at all. It makes sense to have the UFI or BIOS set up parameter encryption because it is a one-time operation. Once we have a session with parameter encryption enabled, we can reuse that session over and over for different comments because the nonce are being replaced. We have fresh nonce 
for every new command, both from the TPM and from the caller, from the host. So this misconfiguration or lack of feature enabling happens at multiple stages. First, it happens at the OEM level, then it can happen at the bootloader level or even at the OS level. To address this issue, there is a new feature coming to the TPM that will provide a complete bus encryption without the need for OEM and OS vendors to take extra steps. At the same time, even today, we can protect ourselves against TPM sniffing by simply using the TPM properly. The bottom line is that when parameter encryption is enabled, TPM sniffing is not possible. Let's now take a closer look how parameter encryption protects us from this danger. Here we have the command request that is sent from the host, usually our secure application, to the TPM. As you can see, there are three standard fields in each comment. This is the tag, the comment size, and the comment code. Afterwards comes the authorization area. This authorization area, as mentioned earlier, can have up to three authorizations. In this case, we have one authorization being used. And this is the authorization for the parent key. Remember, we need a parent key to generate a child key. So where does the authorization for the new child key goes? in the first parameter of this comment called insensitive. This is actually in as input and sensitive as critical data that we need to keep private. When we send this comment to the TPM and it is not encrypted, the password authorization for the child key is there in plain form. What parameter encryption does is perform encryption using the session key that is created during the creation of the TPM session for parameter encryption. The TPM expects the first parameter of this comment to be encrypted and uses the exchanged session key between the host and the TPM at the beginning of that session when it was created to decrypt the parameters. After execution of the comment, the TPM has the possibility to also respond with first encrypted parameter back. And we see here why the first parameter of the response of the TPM to create comment is the actual private material of the new child key. Let's take one more example. Here is the TPM to NVWrite comment that enables us to write bytes in bulk to the NVRAM of the TPM. Here we have two authorization slots being used. And we can use the third one to add a session for parameter encryption. The first parameter of this comment is the data, the input data our own very sensitive user data. By having TPM parameter encryption enabled, we can protect that data and send it in encrypted form to the TPM. The TPM will internally decrypt and store to its internal memory. This way, the data is never exposed to machine in the middle attacks. Here is an example of a comment that cannot use parameter encryption. It can, however, use a TPM HMAC session to protect the overall communication, and in particular to protect the authorizations for this comment. We don't have any data fields, any parameter fields here. We just have the header of the comment, tag, comment size, comment code, and two authorization slots. Therefore, it is recommended to always have an HMAC session started with parameter encryption enabled. So how to use this powerful feature of the TPM? As mentioned, we need to start a TPM session and there is a straightforward way to do that. There is a dedicated command for this and we have a dedicated TPM tool we're going to look in a moment. Because creating an HMAC session requires the out value of an object to feed the entropy for the KDF to generate the session key and exchange with the TPM and the policy session built on top of an HMAC session. In all of these cases, we would need to have a good source of entropy and what better source of entropy than a primary key that is created inside the TPM and its private material never leaves the TPM. So the seed, the entropy for our parameter encryption key, for our session key, in fact, never leaves the TPM. Once we have created our TPM session, we must include this session for the execution of any following TPM command. Usually when we use TPM to tools, there is an argument if a tool supports this and the tool supports it if the comment supports it. This is a dash capital S. And we need to provide the session context that we created when we started the session. Let's take a look. First, we generate a primary key 
By default, this is an RSA 2048 bit key. Then we use the TPM to start out session two and we point that we want to store the session context with a dash S capital. Later, we reuse the session by feeding it to the TPM to create tool. And if you notice, we have specified a policy session for this example. Please also note that we have pointed to our primary key when we start the session. Here is why. In order to feed entropy to our session key and enable parameter encryption, we need to provide some kind of object, either salt, that is just user entropy, or more than that, binding to an object. And we can do both at the same time using the dash C, that is lowercase c. Also, we can specify one of the three types of sessions, trial, policy, or HMAC session. And here you'll notice there is one extra type audit session, which is again based off an HMAC session. By default, we start a trial session that is used to create a policy. So it is very important when we want to enable parameter encryption to make sure to specify either HMAC session or policy session. And here is a good explanation what is the general difference between policy and HMAC session. I would recommend reading the practical guide to TPM 2.0 notebook that is available in the public domain. Just keep in mind, it is highly technical and very detailed. So you would need to have some preliminary understanding of how the TPM works. Otherwise, you might get overwhelmed. Also, reading this book does not exclude having to read the TPM specifications, especially part two about TPM structures and part three about the comments. The screenshots we saw are actually from the part three of the TPM specification about the TPM comments. Here is an example of how to protect the creation of digital signature when using the TPM. Remember, we need to use a TPM object to feed the entropy for the generation of the session key. At the same time, when we operate with the TPM, we want to use a TPM key. As usual, we generate our primary key, then we generate our child key, and afterwards we generate the session. Did you spot the mistake here? Why didn't we generate the session? Right after the primary key generation. The primary key private material never leaves the TPM. We can use that the moment we already have the key generated and start a session with parameter encryption. So we protect the generation of our child key. In this particular example, I did not place any limitation on the authorization of the key. There's no password protection, so it didn't make much of a difference anyway. But in a real case scenario, remember to always start your parameter encryption as early as possible. Typically, I would say use the endorsement key as entropy for salt and binding of the TPM session. Going back to the example, now that we have generated our TPM session for parameter encryption, we must feed that to the TPM2 sign tool. Notice that here, the switch to feed the session is a bit different. It's a dash P. Also, we're specifying that we are passing a session context and there is the file name of the actual context file. Let's have another example of how to use parameter encryption. Here we protect our non-volatile write and read operations to the TPM's memory. We start the TPM session right after the generation of our primary key, and then we feed that session using the dash capital S switch to the nvdefine common using the nvdefine tool. The nvwrite and nvread common have a different syntax. They use a dash capital P switch and also require to specify that we are passing a session. And by using the plus sign, we can add our password authorization for the NV index. If you remember the screenshots we look at the beginning, this guarantees that the user data we are feeding to the TPM is sent between the host, between our program and the TPM in encrypted form. It will be decrypted inside the TPM and directly stored to the TPM non-volatile storage. In a similar fashion, the nvread operation will give us encrypted output of our user data when it is read from the nvram and it will be decrypted by the TSS stack before we can receive it in our application. And when our application lives in a memory isolated environment or it is a trusted execution environment, this provides the highest guarantees that our application and our data is secure from end to end. This is why using parameter encryption is important. Do not forget to start it early on and do not forget to supply the TPM session for parameter encryption when issuing the different TPM to commands and using 
the different TPM2 tools.